بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله إله الأولين والآخرين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح للأمة وجاهد في سبيله حق جهاده وتركنا على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك فصلوات ربي وسلامه عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما وبعد إن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار My respected brothers and sisters in Islam the issue of being steadfast upon this religion is a very, very important matter. In fact, it is the person who actually lives in this West that actually knows what I really mean by being steadfast upon the religion. You see, there are a thousand and one distractions out there. One thousand and one, no perhaps one thousand and two, no even more. There are so many distractions, whether it be for the youth, whether it be for the old, whether it be sex, whether it be drugs, whether it be rock and roll, there are so many distractions out there, ya akhi. It is very difficult to have true istiqama, to be truly steadfast upon this religion. In fact, many a times, you know when I'm in Medina, and then I come back every year, I find certain brothers have left the religion. And I find as well certain brothers have entered the religion. So this issue of istiqama, this issue of istiqama upon the religion, of being steadfast upon the religion is quite, quite difficult. Is and, and, it, and at the same time, therefore, it is quite important. However, the reward for being steadfast upon the religion is tremendous. The reward for actually holding on to the religion, of knowing what you know, and thereafter, afterwards, holding on to what you know, and practicing your religion, even though the, 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 the things against it, are, are, the odds against it are so high, so the rewards are also so high. The rewards are also tremendous. Do you know what the rewards are? You ask me what the reward is? So I tell you, the reward is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُوَعَدُونَ نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاؤُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِيهِ الْأَنفُسُكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ نُزُلًا مِّنْ غَفُورِ الرَّحِيمِ Naam. What a beautiful verse. A beautiful verse. See what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. He says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ So verily those who say, My Lord is Allah. Naam. That Allah is my Lord. Those who, those who say, Allah is my Lord. ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا and thereafter, they remain steadfast upon that. Naam. They remain steadfast upon that. Even though people came and said, accept our religion. People, the Christians came and, and, and they knocked on your door and said, hey, accept Jesus. Accept Jesus and, and, then, and then you'll be guided. Even though the woman came and said, hey, I'm to you and you are to me. Take me. Even though, even though all this happened. Even though the, you heard the music. Even though the Western culture appealed to you. Yet you stayed away from this and you said, Allah is my Lord. You said, Allah is my Lord, and you stayed away from all of this fitna. And you stayed upon your religion, and you held upon your religion, and you, and you lived the sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam, and you kept up your salah, and you kept up your zakat, and you kept up all the sha'ir of Islam, all the signs of Islam. So this is your reward. 
Allah says, inna ladhina qalu rabbun Allah. Verily those who said, my Lord is Allah. Thumma istaqamu. And they remain steadfast upon them. Tatanazzalu alayhimul malaika. Then the angels descend upon them. Naam. The angels, ya akhi. Before even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the glad tidings, the angels come and give you the glad tidings. Because they already knew what a righteous person you are. Because you, you remain steadfast upon your religion. Tatanazzalu alayhimul malaika. تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ The angels descend upon them. And when do the angels descend upon them? At the time of their death. At the time of their death. So the angels descend upon them and say what? تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ And they say to them, أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا Don't be afraid and don't be sorrowful. Don't be tearful. Don't be afraid, ya akhi. Don't be afraid. لا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة and take the glad tidings of Jannah التي كنتم توعدون the Jannah that you had been promised نحن أولياءكم في الحياة الدنيا نحن أولياءكم في الحياة الدنيا verily we used to be your helpers in this in this hayat نعم you see Allah سبحانه وتعالى when you are upon this religion then Allah سبحانه وتعالى sends angels down from the sky to help you to stay upon this religion so whenever, for example, a fitna comes to you, then, then these angels come and whisper into your, into, your, into your ears, tell you, fear Allah, stay away from all of this. They are your helpers, they are your awliya, they are your close friends, they are your helpers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends these angels down so that, so that they may keep you upon the straight path. وَأَبِشِرُ بِالْجَنَّةِ And they give you the glad tidings of Jannah. أَلَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُوَعَدُونَ نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Verily, we were your helpers in the life of this world. وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي الْأَنفُسُكُمْ And in this life, we will also be your friends. And in this life, in Jannah, is for you whatever you wish. وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ Whatever you ask for, it will be for you. نُزُولًا مِنْ غَفُورِ الرَّحِيمِ A beautiful place of staying. A beautiful place. A beautiful accommodation, my brother, for you. Subhanallah. If you were only to say, La ilaha illallah, and thereafter hold on to this by whatever La ilaha illallah uh, 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 requires, whatever La ilaha illallah requires, then indeed this would be your reward. That, on, that when people are dying, and this is the time that the punishment starts, this is the time that the people's punishment starts. Yet if you, were, if you were to hold on to the religion, then indeed you would not have punishment. Yet you would have these angels come down to you and give you glad tidings. These were your friends in this life, and so too they will be your friends in the hereafter. And they give you the glad tidings of paradise. So ya akhi, what is this istiqamah? What is this being steadfast upon the religion? What are we talking about? What are we talking about? Istiqamah. Is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, Istaqim kama umirt. And in another verse he said, Fastaqim kama umirt. And he, what it means is that, uh, be steadfast upon the religion as you have been told by Allah. Be steadfast upon the religion as you have been told by Allah. So how has Allah told us? How has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to be upon this religion? Well you see, one of the most important things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told us, to remain steadfast upon this religion is to stay away from whatever the shaitan calls us to. And whatever leads on to the way of the shaitan. And what are those things that lead to the way of the shaitan? Well, you see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amun, O you who believe, La tattabi'u khutuwat shaitan Don't follow the footsteps of the shaitan. If you can understand this message today, then you will know how to be steadfast upon the religion. If you understand this message, ya akhi, and ya ukhti fillah, if you understand this message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you really know how to be steadfast upon this, uh, upon this religion. Because you see, the shaitan is not dumb. No, we are facing an intelligent enemy. He is a logical person. He is not stupid. If he was stupid, he wouldn't have guided so many logical people away. Correct or not? Rather, he is an intelligent person. Yeah, he's an intelligent, evil, evil, evil being. He's intelligent. He's not going to come and come, come to you and say, go and do that thing, and go and accept Christianity straight away, and go and commit zina, go and commit fornic uh, fornicate straight away. No, he's going to come to you with small, small things, things you don't even realize. Ah, these are the steps of the shaitan. 
These are the steps of the shaitan. You see, when you want to go to the first floor, you have to take the steps. And the steps start down there. You see? And they're very easy to go. But if you had to climb up all the way in one go, it would be very difficult. But the steps are the ones that make it easy for you to reach the first floor. Correct or not? In the same way, such is the shaitan. He doesn't come to you. He doesn't ask you to, 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 to jump and then grab hold and then and then pull yourself up. La, la, la. He is more intelligent than that. He has these steps that he has done for you. These are the footsteps of the shaitan, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Ya ayyuha ladhina amanu, la tattabiu khutuwati shaitan. Be aware of the footsteps of the shaitan. Don't follow the footsteps of the shaitan. What are these footsteps of the shaitan? Let me give you an example. Let's say for example, the, sh- the shaitan comes to you. He comes to you and, say, and says, Oh, look at that girl down there. She's saying salam. Say salam. And say, okay, hi there. Hey, how's it going, Mike? Everything all right? You know, nice, cheerful. And he says, ah, go and give a dawah. She wants to be Muslim. Go and give a dawah. So, mashallah, you want to give dawah, mashallah. Right, so you go and give her dawah. So, do you want to know about Islam? And she says, hey, what are you doing? You can't just look down when you're talking to her. You've got to look at her. Look at her and give dawah. This is the right way. What are you, man? Islam doesn't teach you this. Come on, look at her and give the dawah. I said, oh, hello, sister. How are you doing? Good. Uh, and then the shaitan says, ask her how the weather is. Ask her what she's doing tonight. And then you ask her, sister, you know, if you have time, please read this book. Let her, oh, how's the weather? And then you start chit-chatting. And then the shaitan says, take a number. Take a phone number. You're going you're gonna to tell her about Islam? Yeah. So you take the phone number and you give her your phone number. Right? And the shaitan says, oh, after a couple of hours, oh, what about the sister? You know, what if she dies today? You have to call her. Yalla, give her a call. And you give her a call and she, and she talks in a beautiful voice. And you talk to her in a beautiful voice. And then you say, okay, subhanAllah, you have to give her more dawah. Ask her to, ask her to meet you at, at this spot. And you tell her, sister, please meet me at this spot. And she comes and you come. And then you make it, you know, subhanAllah, little by little, little by little, little by little, until you end up committing zina with her. Until you end up committing zina with her. You see, shaitan is not stupid. He won't say, go and jump and jump on her. No, she's, he's not going to say that. He would be stupid to say that. He would be stupid to say that. But he starts with these small steps. These are the khutuwat of shaitan. These are the small steps of the shaitan. Ya akhi, if you, are, if you can stay away from the first step, then be assured you will never reach the last step of shaitan. If you can stay away from the first step, then be assured you will never reach the last step. This is the first and foremost and most important, important lesson today. And that is stay away from the footsteps of the shaitan. If you wish to be steadfast upon this religion. And mashallah, we know a lot of things. Our practice is very little. We know a lot of things. And if you wish to stay away from the footsteps of the shaitan, then you must, uh, if you wish to stay away from the last step, you must stay away from the first step. Now, you see once an Arab uh, from the desert, came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he said, Ya Rasulullah, tell me one thing. Tell me one thing that will take me into paradise. I apologize, I saw the beautiful uh, beach out there, you know, and I felt thirsty, right? So having some water, right? Uh, he said, Ya Rasulullah, tell me one thing, just one thing. I don't want two, not three, just one. Tell me one thing that will lead me to paradise. This is what we want, correct? We see, you know, for example, uh, you know, Islam is so complicated and it's so multi, you know, so diverse and so many things to know in Islam, etc., etc. So people just say, oh, just leave me all of this. Just tell me one thing and just one thing that will lead me to paradise. Right? Simple answer, correct? This is the American philosophy, correct? Just a simple way to paradise. Right. So the Arab came. And he said, tell me one thing that will lead me to paradise. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Qul, amantu billah. He said, say, I believe in Allah, thumma staqim, and then be steadfast upon it. Naam. You see, my brothers, this hadith has been very greatly misunderstood by us. This hadith has been very greatly misunderstood by us. What do I mean by that? You see, People have taken this hadith and have understood it to mean that we should just say La ilaha illallah and then keep on saying La ilaha illallah and keep on doing whatever we do and then keep on saying La ilaha illallah and then when we die just say La ilaha illallah and straight we'll go to paradise. Correct or not? 
This is what we have understood, isn't it? But this is absolutely false. Absolutely false. The biggest lie. This is the biggest lie that the Muslims are facing. Naam. They just to say La ilaha illallah and khalas, you'll go to paradise? If it was so easy, is, is Islam really so easy? Have you forgotten the second part of what, what of Rasulullah's answer? It was sum, uh, thumma staqim. And then be steadfast upon it. How can you be steadfast upon La ilaha illallah if you do not know the conditions of La ilaha illallah? If you do not know the precepts of La ilaha illallah? If you don't know the shurut of La ilaha illallah? That which La ilaha illallah conditions. You see, you have a key in your pocket, don't you? You have a key. And uh, does anybody have a key that's just, just a long piece of metal? No, it has teeth as well, right? So La ilaha illallah as well has teeth, you see? You must have conditions for every single thing. Life is not that easy. Islam is not easy as well. If you wish to hold on to La ilaha illallah, you must obey, obey the, 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 the conditions of La ilaha illallah. And these conditions are to hold steadfast to this religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, udkhulu fi silmi kafa. Enter into this Islam, this religion in its complete entirety. In its complexity, in its entirety, enter into it completely. Not half, not a fourth of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He revealed the surahs, He changed the orders. And He put them, and He put in, in certain surahs, sometimes a verse would come about a ruling, and sometimes a verse about Bani Israel, and another time a verse about, about Jannah, another time a verse about hell. He did not put all the rulings of, 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 of the Qur'an in one, one surah, and thereafter all, this, all, the, all the verses about Bani Israel in one surah. No, rather He mixed it up. Why? Why, ya akhi? So that you just don't hold on to one part of the Qur'an. Not onto only on one, onto one part of the Qur'an, rather onto, into its entirety, into all of it, all of it, ya akhi. You can't just say, I accept this part and I don't accept that, that part. You can't be steadfast upon something and leave something else. This is not being truly steadfast upon the religion. Being steadfast, ya akhi, is to accept Islam in its complete entirety, in its complexity, in its, tot- in, in its totality, in its, in its total view, in all its ahkam, in all its rulings. You must accept it all and then thereafter be steadfast upon it. And then be steadfast upon it. Indeed, if this is your goal, that the angels descend upon you on the day, on the day that you die, then you must say La ilaha illallah and thereafter be steadfast upon it. One of the most important things to know about being steadfast upon the religion is that the heart must be guided before the limbs. You see, you can't be steadfast upon the religion unless your heart is firstly steadfast upon the religion. Because you see, it's like a ruler. Have you seen, for example, a party, a raiding party, an army? Have you seen an army which is always victorious? Then a victorious army always has a, a fantastic ruler, a fantastic commander, correct or not? A very strong commander. This is what makes a small army win, correct or not? This is what makes a small army win. In the same way, if your body is that army, then your heart is the commander. Your heart is the commander. If your heart is strong upon this religion, if your heart is strong upon this religion, then it, indeed it will guide your limbs to be steadfast upon the religion, and to be upon the religion, and to be upright upon the religion. And if your heart is weak upon the religion, and you truly don't really want this religion, then indeed your limbs will also be the same. Ya akhi fillah, ya ukhti fillah. My dearest brothers and, and sisters in Islam, you must try your level best. You must try your level best to convince yourself and your heart. You convince yourself and your heart to be upon this religion. It is only when your desires are in accordance with what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam came with, that is the time when you know that your limbs will also submit to what he came with. Naam. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, he said, none of you will enter Jannah. He said, none of you will enter Jannah. And another hadith, he said, none of you will, will, will truly believe until your whims and your desires, until your whims and your desires are in accordance with what I came with. Naham. Until your heart, until your heart really wants what I came with. Until your heart really desires what I came with. You can't just say Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi used to keep a beard and I don't want, I don't like keeping beard. You can't say Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, likes, like, used to, used to, used to do this, used to do this, or used to do that, and I don't like to do it. No! No, ya akhi, you can't do that. Rather, your heart 
has to be, and your whims and your desires, which is, which is representative of your heart, has to be in accordance, has to be in accordance with what Rasulullah wasallam came with. This is what true istiqamah uh, entails. This is what truly being upon the uh, upon straight, straight path entails. That your true desires and your inner goals and your aspirations be in accordance with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires of you. Sometimes the going gets very tough. Sometimes I know I've lived in the West, you know, and you know, medical college and all that. You know, life has been very difficult. And the pressure from the family and father saying do well and mother saying do well, you know, you know how it is. And uh, the pressure from the medical college and, uh, uh, you know, it was quite, you know, tremendous pressure. And then the fitna of the women and the fitna of this sex, drugs and rock and roll culture that we live in uh, was quite tremendous. And I'm sure many of my brothers and sisters actually go through this day by day. Even though we may be in denial, even though our elders may be in denial, even though our fathers and mothers may not really truly realize because they're, they're not in tune with what's happening, but this is truly what every youth goes through. What every youth goes through. I understand because I'm from you. I'm one of you. I'm not that old, right? I might have a beard, but I'm not that old. I'm very young. Very, very young. Trust me, I am. But I'm not going to tell you how old I am. Anyway, so really, your life is very difficult. And I realize that. And sometimes, as you know, we say, the going gets tough. Yeah? Like the saying goes, the going gets really tough. Sometimes it's very difficult, your life is very difficult. And to even hold on to a small matter of Islam is like holding on to hot coals. Have you seen hot coals? You see hot coals because in Australia we have a lot of barbecues, right? So we take these black, black coals and then we put a fire onto it, right? And then the fire burns, mashallah, and then it, then it turns red. Then after it turns red, then it turns into, into, in, into this, this uh, uh, gray, gray type thing. So this is when you know the coals are really ready. And then after that you put the meat on it. This is the hot coals. This is the hot coals. So it's like putting your hands into hot coals. Sometimes holding on to a small amount of the religion, whether it be just to, just to you know, uh, leave your lectures to just come and, come and say salah, whether it be just to, uh, 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 you know, I don't know, just give the adhan perhaps, whether it be just to keep a beard, for example, in this society, whatever. Sometimes the religion is so difficult. Sometimes the going is so difficult. Not because the, the, the issue itself is difficult. No, just that just sometimes... You know, when your soul has just really been ta'ban, just been really, really just, you know, had a lot of pressure upon yourself, whether it be the, the, the pressure from the society, pressure from the family, pressure from outside, and the fitna is so great, and the fitna is so great, and the trials and tribulations outside is so great. Yani subhanallah, sometimes it really gets tough. The going gets really tough. Well, akhi, and ukhti fillah, if in such circumstances, you still hold on to the religion, and you still hold on to the religion, and you keep on holding on to the religion, then abshiru, then take the glad tidings. Of what? Glad tidings of a great reward. A great reward. It's not small, it's great. And what is this reward, you ask me? So I tell you, the reward is tremendous. The reward is tremendous. Once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said in an authentic hadith, he said, there will come a time, there will come a time, in which holding on to a small part of the religion is like, is like holding on to hot coals. It's, it's like holding on to hot coals. And for such people who hold on to the religion, even though it is so difficult to hold on to the religion, and for such people who hold on to the religion in such circumstances, will be the reward of 100 companions of mine. 100 of companions of Rasulullah Tremendous reward, tremendous you cannot imagine. You cannot imagine the reward. You see, the least person in paradise. Do you know the least person in paradise? The person with the lowest rank in paradise? Do you know what his reward is? His reward is 10 times and another generation, 100 times of what this world has. What is in this world and all that it contains and 10 times of this or 100 times of this. Imagine that. This is the least reward in Jannah. The least reward in Jannah. So what is the reward of a companion of Rasulullah? And what is the reward of a person who has hundred times of a companion of Rasulullah? Tremendous reward. Tremendous reward. This is why, akhi, when the going gets tough, know that the reward is also tremendous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you're going through, ya akhi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closer to you, closer to you than, than, than yourself. Closer to you than yourself. He knows you. He's the one who created you. He knows what you're going through. 
He knows what you're going through for him, ya akhi. You're not alone in this knowledge. You're not alone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you're going through. So you must hold on to the knowledge, hold on to the religion. When the going gets so tough, so tough, you must still hold on to religion. As, as tough it may be. For example, you may be, you know, a big lecturer, you may be a big, uh, a big manager at work. And, and people say, hey, come and have a drink with us. Or come and do this with us. And the fitna may be great. And the women may be really inviting. Subhanallah, if you hold on to the religion, if you hold on to the religion, then the reward will be tremendous. But if you did not hold on to the religion, then you are the greatest loser. There is no other loser except you. You are the greatest loser. Naam. Why? Because you have lost such a great reward. What a great loser you are. Tremendous loser you are. But if you held on to the religion, held on and had patience, then your reward would be tremendous. Tremendous. Something we can't even imagine. Something we can't even imagine. And if I started to talk about the rewards in Jannah, about the descriptions of Jannah, and the descriptions of the women in Jannah, and wallahi I can sit here for two hours describing the women of Jannah, how her, her body is. I can describe to you every single thing I know about her. It'll take me two hours to describe her. If you were to only know about the rewards in Jannah that awaits a person who holds on to the religion, then no way would you ever leave this religion for anything else. La ya akhi, holding on to the religion would be more beloved to you than to be thrown into, in, in, into a pit of fire. There are three things you need to know when the going gets tough. Three things that you need to know when the going gets tough. The first and most important thing is to be patient. The first and for, for most important thing is to be patient upon your religion. You see, when the going gets tough, there's nothing you can do except just sit down, have a drink of water, or you know, perhaps you know, Diet Pepsi or something, just to get your system running up again and say, you know, sabr, sabr, sabr. Patience, patience, and patience. There's nothing that you can do except be patient. When it is really tough, and you need to get married, and you're not married, and I know the feeling, when it's really tough, sit down, take a glass of water, and just be patient. And just convince yourself to be patient. The second thing you need to do, the second thing you need to do, is to think about the great reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you for being, for being patient. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you for being patient. And what is that reward? I just told you the reward. The reward is tremendous. Tremendous. It has no, it has no monetary value, ya akhi. It has no finite value that I can give you. You see, we think, we think in finite terms. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in infinite terms. What do I mean by infinite terms? I mean this dunya is finite. You see, 70 years you will live perhaps. But then the akhirah is, is infinite. It will last forever. How can something that will last forever compare to something that only lasts 70 years? Can it ever compare? It can never compare. Never can this life compare to the hereafter. Never can this life compare to the hereafter. A foot, a foot length, a length of paradise is better than what this earth contains and all and, and everything in it. What this earth contains and everything in it. Just the, the khimar, the wrapping of the, of the woman of paradise is better than this earth and all that it, all the, all that it contains. Subhanallah. If all of this is known, then just remember the tremendous reward that awaits you, that awaits you if you were to be steadfast upon this religion. And the third thing, akhi, that you need to know is remember those people bef before you, those pious predecessors before you, those Muslims before you who had so much difficulty in their life, yet they held on to the religion. They held on just like they bit they, 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 were, they were biting the roots of the tree and held on even though they were being pulled away, they were still holding on to the religion. And I give you the example of Yusuf alayhi salam. Do you know the story of Yusuf alayhi salam? What happened to Yusuf alayhi salam? You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he created beauty, he divided beauty in half. Naam. He, when he created beauty, he divided beauty in half. And half of beauty he, he, he gave to all of creation, and the other half he gave to Yusuf alayhi salam. Naam. So he was so beautiful, so handsome, you can't even, even imagine. MashaAllah, you look in the mirror and you see a handsome man, don't you? When you look in the mirror, you say, MashaAllah, what has Allah created? 
What a beautiful creation Allah has created. But Yusuf salam will put you to shame. Naam. He'll put you to shame because he was even more beautiful than that. So what happened to Yusuf salam? Allah subhanahu wa tells us that when he grew up, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ When he grew up and he became a young man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him hikmah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him hikmah. And then what happened? Gave him hikmah meaning made him a prophet. And then what happened, ya akhi? What happened to Yusuf alayhi salam? You see, he was very tremendously beautiful. And the woman in whose house he was staying in could not control herself. And I don't think there's a woman who can really control herself when they saw a man so magnificent. So magnificent. Okay. So she couldn't control herself. And she closed the doors. And Yusuf salam was in the room. And she said, Haytalak. She said, what? Haytalak, come to me. Come to me, I am for you. And she took her clothes off. Come to me, I am for you. Subhanallah. And what did Yusuf say? Ma'adallah. He didn't say, okay. He said, Ma'adallah. He said, A'udhu Billah. He said, glory be to Allah. Glory be to Allah. And he, subhanallah, he remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that point. He remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that point. This woman was giving herself to him. A beautiful woman because she was the wife of the Aziz. Wife of the rich man. She was the wife of the minister, the finance minister. And you're the finance minister at the time of the Pharaoh at that time. Right? He had of course all the wealth. Right? Obviously. So he could also, his wife would be very pretty. Correct or not? Right? And so this woman, she wanted to give herself to Yusuf. And she said, and he said, Ma'adallah. Ma'adallah. إِنَّهُ رَبِّي أَحْسَنَ مَثْوَاي إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ Verily he is my Lord, meaning he's talking about Aziz. He's talking about Aziz. إِنَّهُ رَبِّي أَحْسَنَ مَثْوَاي He has indeed given me a lot of good. So I can't just commit zina with you. I can't commit zina with you. إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ And indeed he says, and indeed the ظَالِمِينَ will never, will, never will, will never succeed. ظَالِمِينَ will never succeed. And then he says, وَلَقَدْ حَمَّ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is in your heart. Naam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is in your heart. So he's, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ حَمَّتْ بِهِ وَحَمَّ بِهَا And indeed he had desired her. Indeed she had desired him. And he had desired her. Naam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is in his heart. Knew what is in his heart. He knows. So he says, that indeed she had desired him. And he had desired her. لَوْلَا أَرْرَآ بُرْحَانَ رَبِّهِ And had it not been that he saw the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ulama deferred, what was the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But the sign of Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really is talking about, the, the correct interpretation of this verse, is that the realization of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entered into his heart. The realization that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take him into account. The realization that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not sent him to this world in order to just, you know, commit haram and commit zina and proliferate like that. Yet Allah has sent him for a lofty purpose. And that lofty purpose is to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to worship him. This realization entered into his heart. And so, لَوْلَا أَرْرَآ بُرْحَانَ رَبِّهِ And so, had it not been that, he, that this burhan came to him, this proof came to him, he would have been from the Dhalimeen. Indeed, he would have wronged himself. And so happened what happened, and he ran away from, from her, and she ran after him, and then he tore her, his clothes from the back, and then of course you know the story what happened. But subhanAllah, what an amazing thing. What an amazing thing. Yusuf alayhi salam, he held strong upon the religion. He held steadfast upon the religion. Naam, he held on to the religion, even though the odds were against him, even though his own soul was telling him, sin, sin, sin. Even though, وَلَقَدْ حَمَّدْ بِهِ Even though she desired him, وَحَمَّ بِهَا And he desired her. Even then, even then he held on, he held on to the religion. And what about the example of Rasulullah wasallam? What about the example of Rasulullah, our Habib? Our beloved Rasulullah wasallam? What about his, his example? You see the mushrikeen came to Rasulullah wasallam's uncle, Abu Talib, and said, Oh Abu Talib, go and tell your, your, uh, your, your nephew. Go and tell your nephew that if he leaves what he's calling to, then we will, give, we will marry him to the most beautiful women of our tribe. And we will give him whatever wealth he wants. And we will make him the leader of our tribe if, if, if that is what he wants. If that is what he wants. But we'll give him anything he wants for him to leave his religion. And so Abu Talib came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said what? He came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
and said, Ya Bunay, so oh my son, this is what this is what the people have told me. So what do you say? So what do you say? And Rasulullah sallallahu was reciting the Quran. And he looked up to his to his uncle. He's looked up, he looked up to his uncle. And he said, Oh my uncle. He said, Oh my uncle. Wallahi, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, were they to bring the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, I would not leave calling to this religion even for one minute. Wallahi, if they brought the sun in my right hand and the moon in the left, I will not have left leaving calling to this religion even for one minute. Look at the strength of his istiqama. Look at the strength of his steadfastness upon this religion. This is what I'm talking about, ya akhi. Holding on to the religion when the going gets tough. Holding on to the religion when the attractions of this life are so great. And it is so easy to let go. This is what I'm talking about, ya akhi. Today, mashallah, you have learnt a lot. Today you have learnt a lot. But then, the real time for practice starts when you leave the door right now. When you leave, you see, and you leave and go out, and the distractions call you today is what? Today is Sunday? Sunday, right? Yeah, Sunday, party day, right? Party time. When you go past the city center and you see all the haram and, and they call you, Ta'ali Abdullah, come and have a nice time with us, party. Yalla, Ya Abdullah, O oh, slave of Allah, come and party with us. Yeah, this is when the practice starts, Ya Akhi. This is when the practice starts. When what you have learned that needs to be practiced, Ya Akhi. This is the true practice. Have you heard as well the story of Mus'ab ibn Umair? Mus'ab ibn Umair, one of the companions, one of the young companions of Rasulullah Mus'ab ibn Umair was like a uh, playboy. You know a playboy? I mean, I couldn't find any other word to say, but he was a playboy. What was a playboy? You see, he had the best of cars. At that time, of course, they didn't have cars. They had the best of horses and camels. And he had the best of clothes. Of course, they didn't, they didn't wear shirt and pants and suit. Of course, they had thobes and other things that they used to wear. And he had the best of perfumes. And of course, I'm not talking about Giorgio Armani and all these other jupe and all the other you know, modern perfumes. I'm talking about the beautiful perfumes of Arabia at that time. And he was slick. You know, slick, slick. Have you seen a slick guy? Slick. And he was hot. The women used to love him. Yes, he was. All these words are, are, are you know, these modern translations of these Arabic words that ulama have to use to describe him. Yeah. And he was such, an, such a beautiful young man. Musa ibn Umair was the talk of the town. He could not walk around a uh, street except that the women would look and just peek out the window, look, ah, Musa ibn Umair. And the men would <laughs> smell and they would know, ah, Musa ibn Umair would walk past. He was such a grand young man, a slick individual. He was a playboy of the town of Quraysh. Right, Musa ibn Umair. And his parents were extremely rich and gave him whatever he wanted. Clothes, perfume, women, anything he wanted he had. Yet when he accepted Islam, and he accepted Islam in the early days of, of, of the message of Rasulullah, right in Mecca, when the, when the time was tough, when he accepted Islam, everything went. Ya Akhi, everything went. His clothes, his perfume, the women, the talk of the town, everything went. Everything went. So neither did he have his beautiful clothes, nor any beautiful perfume. In fact, the ulama have described in the books of Sirah, they said that he only had a piece of clothing to cover his private parts. That's all he had. Neither did he have food, neither did he have clothing, neither the perfume, nothing at all, because his parents, who are non-Muslim, took everything away from him. Just to, just to see if they could punish him, make him come back. But no, ya akhi, he was true upon this religion. He held steadfast upon this religion, even though these things were all taken away from him. Ya Akhi, he is not an old man, so, that, so, so you can't associate with him. He is young like you and me. He was a young man like you and me. Imagine if everything was taken away from you, so that you may relieve your religion. Will you listen to that? Sometimes, for example, you know, when I'm doing dawah, brothers come to me and say, uh, Brother, my mother said, we, I can't do this. Or my mother said, I can't have this. Or my mother said, I have to cut my beard because... You know, uh, because if I keep my beard, my mother's not going to give me my car, or my mother's not going to let me do this or that, and you become so, and they become so afraid of their parents. Subhanallah, 
Or sometimes I hear brother saying, brother, I can't, you know, really come for Juma because my work is going to, you know, it's going to affect my work. Or the boss is, or the boss is not letting me. Brother, I'm, you know, I've got kids and I've got to feed my family and I've got to pay off my car. And I've got to pay off my house and I've got to live a decent life and I've got to enjoy my life too. Brother, let me just, just, you know, keep on working at such a, such, such a place. Ya yeah, akhi, this is a shameful question. I'm ashamed when I hear this. I'm ashamed. Because when we read about the stories of, of the companions of Rasulullah and how they were steadfast upon this religion, we feel ashamed that indeed this religion that we are holding upon is perhaps not the same religion. No. When we read these stories, it is as if it's a different religion they used to live. A different life they used to live. Yes, it is indeed a different life they used to live. And so Musa ibn Umayr, this is how, how he became. And you know, in the Battle of Badr, in the battle in which Musa ibn Umayr died, the companions narrate that Musa ibn Umayr, his skin had become rough from all the all, from all the all, all the time that he had uh, spent without without a uh, without something to cover his top, top part of his, top part of his body where his skin used to be the smoothest and the whitest of skin it became dark and scaly and he didn't have anything to cover indeed on the on the on the day of badr he he took a companion's legs and he grabbed his uh, grabbed his legs and he slept like that because he had nothing just to get the heat from his from from his feet just to get the heat from his feet because it was cold on the night of Al-Badr. And in Badr, as you know, he died. He died. Ya akhi fillah, ya ukhti fillah. My dear brothers and elders in Islam, this is the steadfastness upon the religion that I'm talking about. This is how you should be steadfast upon the religion. MashaAllah, I'm not here to tell you something new about the religion. I'm only telling you to be steadfast upon what you already know. What you already know, you know a lot, MashaAllah. Practice is little, knowledge is a lot. Practice is very little, I'm only telling you. And this is my message today. Just to be steadfast upon what you already know. What you already know from salah, what you already know from zakat, what you already know from fasting, what you already know from saying la ilaha illallah and its conditions, then be steadfast upon it. And be idhnillah, you will be from those people who the malaika come down and the malaika come down and they give them the glad tidings of a Jannah wa abishiru bil Jannati lati kuntum tu'adun and take the glad tidings of the Jannah that you have been promised nahnu awliya'ukum fil hayati dunya verily we were your companions and you help us in the life of this of, the, of this world wa lakum fiha ma tashtahi al anfusukum and in that life is for whatever you want wa lakum fiha ma tadda'oon and for you is whatever you want nuzulam min ghafur rahim a beautiful place of dwelling from the ghafur rahim from the one who is most merciful most beneficent. Subhanallah, Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. If you don't mind, I will answer in English, inshallah, so that you know everyone can benefit. Actually, it's quite important questions. Zakul khair for the brother who asked these questions. Uh, the first one is uh, yeah, The first question is: Can you explain? And clarify the issue about uh, the women of this dunya are the Sayyidat, are the uh, the leaders of the Hurul Ain. Yes, uh, actually, I can clarify that question. Alhamdulillah, and uh, and this is an important matter because unfortunately, you know, we brothers always talk about the Hurul Ain as if uh, you know we leave the sisters out. No, no, actually, this is not intended. Uh, it is only intended to actually make the brothers feel more uh, comfortable and uh, you know desire to to go to Jannah. It is not intended to put the sisters down at all. Uh, indeed, the sisters of of, the, of this dunya, those who had taqwa and were righteous and entered into Jannah, then indeed they will be from the Sayyidat of the Hurul Ain. Yes, this is an authentic hadith, an authentic hadith in uh, in, uh, in in Musnad Imam Ahmed. The Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, authentic hadith in Musnad Imam Ahmed. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the women of this world, mean this, meaning the mu'minat. The believing women of this world, when they enter Jannah, they will be 70 times more beautiful than the Hurul Ain. They will be 70 times more beautiful than the Hurul Ain. So it is true, therefore, that, that they will also be from the Sayyidat, as well, with the, as well as we can understand from the, from the, from the narrations, uh, that they will be from the Sayyidat and also actually more beautiful. So just because we talk about Hurul Ain doesn't mean your wife won't be more beautiful, your wife will actually be more beautiful, if they actually enter Jannah. Uh, 
بكل بعد عند الشيخ ابن تيميه الشيخ زمان حرم المقيم وحفظ بلا نقفة نعم the second question is some people say that ابن تيميه رحمه الله permitted ابن تيميه رحمه الله is a great scholar in Arnaza in Saudi Arabia is one of the few great scholars of this ummah uh, that uh, that have died رحمه الله رحمة واسعة and uh, that he ajaza that he permitted uh, the the luhum المذبوحة الغير المذبوحة the that the meat that has been not that has not really been slaughtered upon the uh, correct manner uh, to be uh, to be to be consumable for Muslims. Uh, the issue that Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah really permitted was that uh, was uh, was the statement that this country, uh, the Western countries, uh, where where the Aqliyat al Muslimin are here, uh, and such as you know such as England, such as America, uh, he used to consider the people of this land to be. Ahl al-Kitab to be Ahl al-Kitab, and so therefore he permitted eating of the uh, of the of the meat of the Ahl al-Kitab because of the statement of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Al-yawma uhilla lakum al-tayyibat wa ta'amu al-ladhi nawtu al-Kitab hilla lakum wa ta'amukum wa ta'amuhum hilla lak ta'amu al-ladhi nawtu al-Kitab hilla lakum wa ta'amukum hilla lahum. Anyway, this is a verse. Lakhbat alayhi shoya. Basically, the verse mentions. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اليوم أحل لكم الطيبات Today everything good has been permitted for you. And طعام الذين أوتوا الكتاب And the food of those people uh, who have been given uh, uh, the book have been permitted for you. And your food has been permitted for them. Based upon this, uh, uh, the ulama have permitted the eating of the food of the, the meat of the Ahl al-Kitab, of the, uh, of the Jews and Christians. Uh, and so Ibn al rahimahullah used to in general consider these countries to be Ahl al-Kitab. Uh, however, uh, this uh, opinion of Shaykh Shaykh Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah is not supported by many other ulama. Many other ulama who have actually lived in this West and have more contact with this West have have uh, have not permitted this uh, because of the fact that from the shurut of of, of dhabh is um, as vast majority of ulama say to say Bismillah. So to say the, the saying of Bismillah uh, while slaughtering is one of the most important conditions, which vast majority of ulama except for the Shafi'i madhab. Uh, say is a precondition for for slaughtering, uh, and uh, and uh, does not. Uh, yani this condition of saying Bismillah is is a condition whether the person who slaughters is a Muslim or a non-Muslim. Because at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Jews and Christians also used to slaughter in the name of uh, of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, not in the name of anyone else. Of course, nowadays we never know whether it is a Jew or a Christian or a or a polytheist or a or an atheist or an agnostic and I, even I remember checking uh, some of the bulletin boards in America I think about seven years ago and uh, and the results of the religious results of the religious bulletin bulletin board was that 95 percent of of Americans are either, are either atheist or agnostic are either atheist or agnostic so where are we to say therefore that the, that the meat coming from their places is, is halal and even and even I remember a, a, a religious ruling from the from the scholars of the board of, of uh, of Saudi Arabia, and they gra- they graded a lot of the meat that even comes into Saudi Arabia itself to be haram, whether it be from Brazil and some places from from England. And I remember I had read rep- reports of certain Islamic organizations from England who wrote to the uh, to the Sharia Council there, to the uh, board of ulama over there, and they gave the fatwa that this that this meat is haram, that this meat is not permissible to be eaten. Of course, this was about ten years ago. The fatwa was ten years ago that I read, uh, and so this really shows if the meat coming in from to, to over there. Is also not haram. Then this would uh, more, uh, you know, be, you know, this would be more applicable to the meat over here. My my uh, um, understanding is, and you know, I have a uh, a book that is coming up, in the after you know, in a couple of months, on the issue of halal. Uh, in the law, we hope to uh, print it soon, inshallah. It's a very detailed study of halal and the procedure of of slaughtering and all that from the classical sources. Uh, uh, and uh, my conclusion after this research is. That the meat over here is absolutely not permissible for someone to be to eat, uh, whether it be McDonald's, whether it be Hardee's, whether it be sorry we don't have Hardee's here, whether it be uh, you know Burger King, f- fast food, whether it be any any normal restaurants, uh, but uh, so therefore it would not be permissible for anyone to eat this sort of meat. Uh, and Rahimullah Sheikh Uthameen, he was a uh, mujtahid, and uh, he has his own opinion. Rahimullah. However, this is not supported. This opinion of his is not supported by many of the ulama. Uh, Sheikh Sheikh Ibn Uthameen, Rahimullah. He was asked about the meat that comes into Saudi Arabia from other other places. Uh, yes, yes, I'll speak louder. Yes, yes, can you hear me now, inshallah? Okay, Sheikh. Sheikh Ibn Thamir, rahimullah, I think it's a phone I'm listening to. Okay, Sheikh Ibn Thamir, rahimullah. Okay, sorry. 
It's Chinese, eh? <laughs> oh, it's on the microphone. Yeah. Shaykh Ibn Taymin, rahimullah, he was asked about the meat that comes into Saudi, and he used to see it permitted, you see. Many of the meat like that comes from Brazil, from France, you know, the Duke's chicken and all that, if someone lived in Saudi Arabia, would know the imported meat and the imported chickens over there. He used to com- see it permissible, whereas many of the other ulama did not see it permissible. So his opinion really is quite different from the rest of the people. Okay. The next point was, Antu al-Dih mas'ala al-Ta'meen wa hukmuhu al-Ta'meen al hayat now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not, has not permitted us to eat uh, each other's wealth without, without any permissible reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not permitted us to eat each other's wealth without any permitted reason. And ta'meen or insurance is from these sort of eatings without permitted reason. However, akhi, this issue of ta'meen in the West is quite important. Guys, don't be distracted inshallah. It's from the ways of shaitan, yeah? Steps of the shaitan. Don't be distracted, guys. Come on. Over here. Yeah. Uh, Ta'meen is from the ways of what am I saying? Ta'meen is from the ways of actually eating people's money without due cause, without due reason. Uh, and the issue of ta'meen is actually quite misunderstood in the West, quite misunderstood, because you see the non-Muslims they use this issue of ta'meen for some so for certain things which are halal and certain things, certain things which are haram. Like for example, we have uh, you know in Australia we have something called. Uh, RACV, it's called the automobile insurance, right? Where this guy actually, you know, I mean, you, you know, insure your car, and then whenever your car breaks down, then they come and they fix your car up for you, right? This is what do you call it, AA? Yeah, yeah, AA, yeah. It's something called AA over here. I've, saw, I've seen a couple of cars on the road saying AA, right? So this is uh, an, a type of, they, they call this insurance, correct? Correct me if I'm wrong. Do they call this insurance a service insurance when they actually come and they fix your car, you know, uh, throughout the year for a certain fee that you pay them yearly? Breakdown yeah. right, break assistance, right. In Australia, they call it insurance, okay? They call it breakdowns, roadside insurance, right? And so this is a misnomer, this is a misnomer, this is a wrong term. This type of insurance is halal. This type of insurance is halal. What am I saying is halal? Why? Because it's a service agreement. It is like, for example, you make an agreement with the gym, right? And you say, and the gym says membership for, for the gym is a, is a, is a hundred pounds for a year. So you pay the hundred pounds and you can use the gym whenever you want throughout the year. If you don't use the gym, then this money will run out, right? And you have no right to take the money back. This is the same as this roadside insurance. Why? Because it, 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 you just say, uh, if my car breaks down, then you will come and fix my car wherever I am. This is the agreement and this is for a thousand pounds yearly, for example, right? So this is the type of insurance which is, which is halal. However, the type of insurance which is haram is an insurance of m- transaction of money. You see, this AA transaction is a transaction of money for a service, correct? But the insurance such as ta'min al-hayat, the life insurance, and the insurance of medical insurance, is a transfer of money, money, correct? A transfer of money, money, meaning that whenever you get you die, you'll get a load of money. Or whenever you get sick, then the, whatever the bills are, they will pay for. Okay, the company will pay for. So, uh, this is the type of insurance which is not permitted in Islam. A transaction wherein you pay uh, a money, and they pay and, and, they, and they pay your bills or they pay some a certain amount of money back to you. However, it is if it is a transaction of money and a service, right? That you get back a service, or you be, or, or you get back a good from them, a commodity from them, then this is permissible, right? So if you, for example, had a health insurance with a particular uh, uh, hospital, I know I know they don't have this here. In certain countries, they have it, like in uh, in in Urdun, in Jordan, and other places. I know that in certain certain doctors. You know, the people, what they do in the villages, they give the doctors, you know, uh, you know, whatever, 100 pounds, let's say, and they say, well, if I get sick throughout the year, you will look after me. So whenever I get sick, you look after me. Yeah, and if he doesn't get sick, then the money, go, money goes, right? So this is just the same as the AA. This is permissible. What is not permissible is like a, is like a bank, for example, or an insurance company. They say that, okay, whenever you're sick, just give us the receipts for, you know, what, you know, whichever hospital you went to, and we'll pay the hospital ourselves. This is what is not permitted. In the same way, the life insurance is not permitted. Yes, the father, Sheikh. Because what we're asking about, not the life insurance, we're asking, I drive a car. Yes, what okay. driving insurance. There are two things, we're mixing two things here. Right. AA is, as you said, is, uh, service uh, insurance. Service. That's different. That's okay. different, yes. That's different, totally. Right. Uh, I buy the law, I can't drive this car. Yes. Unless I pay third party or competence. Great. Okay, because if I hit your car, or yes. I kill you or something, yes. okay, Yes. Then the, that the insurance. Yes. This is what we are asking about. Right. Okay. So the brother is asking about the insurance which is compulsory at this time, which is the uh, which is the third party insurance. My advice uh, regarding this, and uh, and this is opinion of a vast majority of the ulama of our time, 
who have been asked similar questions about the type of insurance which is obligatory, such as the driving insurance, such as might be house and contents insurance. In certain countries, it's obligatory. I don't know what is the situation here. But let's say the third, the third party, which is compulsory, as in Australia as well, is the same thing. Then we say that in such a situation, you, uh, uh, let's say you have been, you know, you paid insurance for the last 10 years and you've been paying 100 pounds each year. And so over the last 10 years, uh, the amount of money you've given the company is how much? 1,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds, right? And so let's say you have an accident, then my advice is that you take only the equivalent of what you have paid, which is 1,000 pounds, not more than that. Okay? Not more than that. Meaning, for example, if the accident cost, the, cause of the, the, the cost of the accident was actually 2,000 pounds, you actually only claim 1,000 from them, and the other 1,000 you pay from yourself, if that is possible. If that is possible. I know in Australia this is, this is possible. We can actually claim an, uh, an amount. I claim an amount and the excess and uh, the extra we, we, we pay for it ourselves. So basically what you're doing is the amount of money you've given them, you're getting back the same. Right? This is the best way of doing it. This is the best way of doing it. Of course this is majburi. This is something you are uh, forced into doing, Akhi. And so, uh, you know, uh, you know, the ethem is lifted because, uh, because you know, the, uh, the the difficulty of driving without a car is so tremendous, and this is something which uh, really uh, we can say in Arabic, uh, you know, Ahmad uh, bihil balwa, Ahmad bihil balwa. You know, this issue of uh, insurance and third-party insurance. Yes, brother. Uh, so issue, Same issue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, going back to the AA insurance, I want to find it a bit confusing in the sense that. For example, you might be a member of the AA. <clears throat> you have a breakdown when you call the AA. They send RAC, which is the nearest, another company does the same thing. Yes. Which is the nearest car to you. Yes. You get your car fixed. Yep. AA bills RAC. You have received the service, but the transaction of money still has taken place. So where do you draw the line? No, they have made them an agent. Yeah, but they paid them. They got an invoice. Yeah, but, they, but the transaction is between you and, and AA only. It doesn't matter what AA and RSC has. The, the agreement between you and AA is an agreement of a service. So and, and AA is unable to service you at this point, so it makes a wakil. So it makes the RSC a wakil, and the, and the RS, RSC takes care of it, and so AA pays him. This is fine. Brother, can I make a... a yeah, of course. We, uh, we have a very limited time. The Abu Yusuf will be staying with us, inshallah, for the food afterwards. Can I ask if, if, if the debate is going to carry on with uncertain issues? Yeah. Can we come back to it? Because we have a pile of questions to get through. So inshallah, if we can agree yeah, on this topic, we'll be finished afterwards. Inhallah. So inshallah, we'll have one from the sisters. Oh, okay, and then, uh, Can I ask about the main, about the main topic which the Sheikh spoke about? And then we'll get to the questions. Which one? About the... The, the issues related to the topic. Okay, the main topic is the Sifama. Yeah, inshallah. You, after this one, you're, you're next, inshallah. Right. <coughs> Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa salam. The Prophet sallallahu said that the people that will be with him in Jannah will be mainly those that will come after him. Can you recall the hadith to us? And my question is, is it referring to the people of Palestine only? I'm sorry, I don't know a hadith like this. That the people that will be with him in Jannah will be mainly those that will come after him. Uh, Allah ta'ala, I've never come across a hadith like this. I do not know of it. And my question is, is it referring to the people of Palestine only? Uh, I do not know of any hadith like that. Perhaps you're referring to the hadith of Rasulullah wherein he talked about Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, and then, and then he said, Hum bisham, hum bisham, they are in Sham, they're in Sham. Uh, meaning Sham meaning the people of, uh, you know, the, the area, area of Sham, which is Palestine, Jordan, uh, you know, Syria, Damascus, uh, around that area. Uh, but I'm sorry, I do not know of a hadith in this point. Yeah. Okay, the other question the brother had. Yes, the brother is asking about uh, boycotting goods and about boycotting uh, the Western goods and whether uh, uh, and how should uh, how should that be dealt with? Uh, this is what you're asking, Akhi, about boycotting. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, about boycotting goods and about uh, uh, and and how and, and how we should be boycotting and whether that should be really applied here. Uh, uh, indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us as friends. We mu'mineen are believers and help us to one another. So we are obliged by our religion to help each other first. We are obliged by our religion to help each other first and to be friends. And whatever that dictates, whatever that friendship di dictates, 
whether it be from helping each other monetarily, such as giving the obligatory zakat and the zakat al-fitr, etc., or, uh, uh, you know, in voluntarily, such as giving them, giving our Muslim brothers charity, and such as, for example, giving our neighbors charity, we are obliged to help each other, uh, not only just physically, but as well monetarily. And boycotting of goods is something which, which, is, which can be applied as a halal means, a halal, a, a halal means of actually uh, uh, trying to force certain uh, Western um, methodologies which are anti, anti-Islamic uh, upon, uh, upon, uh, in order to be favorable to the Muslims. However, I hope that this will not cause backlash. If it does cause backlash, which I'm seeing at the moment, I do not advise this at all. Because you're living in the West, yeah, Akhi, you, my, uh, my brother and sister in Islam, you're living in the West, and you wish to boycott the West, I, can, I do not see how that is possible. I do not see how that is physically ever possible. So, so I do not ask you to be anti-West at this point. And uh, be, just because you're living here, and you know you should build a community here, I mean, you know, there's no way that you can really, I can't, practically I can't say everybody get out of here, I can't. And this would be wrong for me to say as well. It would be wrong for me to say. So I do not say, say I do not tell you to boycott the West, because this is practically impossible for you to boycott the West. Uh, but I do say that, uh, that help your brothers wherever they are, in whatever way you can, whether it be dua, whether it be with your money and your charity, in whatever way possible. Um, uh, what you usually mean by boycotting uh, the West, I mean boycotting uh, in, uh, within Muslim communities, is that uh, we talk really especially about companies that are openly, say, uh, well, let me just say, let me just say, yeah, I mean, just to give you an example of how disunited the Muslims are, you know, mashallah, we have Makka Kola, right? You see Makka Kola? When did Makka Kola come out? Six months or so? Six months, right? And mashallah, how many callers do we have now, Muslim callers? We have Qibla Kola, Aqsa Kola, we have Medina Kola, we have Muslim Kola, we have anti-Muslim Kola, no, what else? <laughs> Whatever Kola you can think of, we have. And so many more in the pipeline. So many more in the pipeline. See how disunited we are. And every one of them is saying, don't drink stupid. Drink, you know, think before you drink. I said, subhanallah. This is amazing. And every one of them says 10% to Palestine and 10% to local charities. Correct or not? Amazing. Well, you know, look at how disunited we are. We can't even drink the same cola. Hey? Subhanallah. So this is an effect of, you know, I mean, we're talking about boycotting. We're, we're making fun of ourselves, guys. We're making fun of ourselves. And you hold on to the religion, hold steadfast upon the religion before you start, you know, being, t- trying to do things which are, you're not able to do. And this boycotting can be done in Muslim countries, not, not whilst you are in the Muslim minority here. You can't boycott when you're a Muslim minority. You can't. You're buying fuel, right? Don't you drive a car? You're buying fuel. Where are you buying fuel from? The local station. The local station is Muslim? No. Then you're not boycotting. What are you talking about boycotting, Akhi? Now, the drug car you're driving. Is it a Muslim car? Muslims don't have cars. Yeah, which Muslim country has a car? You know, I've seen, I've seen Proton, I think, in Malaysia. Nice big car, mashallah. Small car, but when you go in, it's very roomy. Yeah, it's a nice car. But, you know, they don't sell it here. You're driving a German car, you drive an American car, you drive a British car, you're driving, so you just can't boycott. Yes? Sorry, I don't want to... Brother, brother, you can ask me later on, brother. That'll be the last time I'll uh, comment on this. But, I mean, uh, a lot of Americans boycott Nestle for their policies. Sorry? A lot of Americans boycott Nestle for their policies in Africa. Yes. I mean, uh, it's not... I'm not suggesting we should boycott the West, but some, I mean, if Americans are doing that, it puts us into shame. If we know some companies that are openly anti-Islamic, say like Mark Spencer, for example, are openly supporting Zionism, I mean, these are the ones that I, I don't, I would, I would not condemn anybody who does buy from them. But for myself, Great, Akhi, for you, uh, people are listening to. For me, every Tom, Dick and Harry listens to me. I'm in a different position. I cannot give an advice that will affect a lot of people. There are Muslims that work in Marks and Spencer, right? There are Muslims that are, that, that are directly affected by, the, by that company, that have direct relations with that company. I cannot say anything that will affect a person uh, because my situation is a bit different from yours. What you're saying is correct. I'm not against what you're saying. Correct, Akhi? But I cannot give an advice that will affect the Muslim community here. I'm a responsible person over this Muslim community. And I'm looking at all a, di- a thousand different faces and a thousand different uh, 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 situations and I cannot give a, a recommendation to someone that will adversely affect their life. Plus, my brother, you are living in a society here, you're surrounded by people uh, of a different faith, and you cannot be so militant. You cannot be so militant, ya akhi. I mean, you know, look what has happened in Bosnia. I mean, it's not, it's not that far away. Look what's happened in Kosovo. It's not that far away. Look what is happening elsewhere in the world. You, I mean, I don't want 
that you, you know, you leave England in a coffin. I want that you leave England for a holiday, yeah? But I don't want you to leave England in a coffin. Do you understand what I mean, Akhi? Now, I don't, you know you're from Mecca, but I don't want you to go and be married in Mecca in a coffin. I want you to go there for Hajj, not for burial, okay? So please. Zakallah khair. Yes, louder as well. Yes. Okay. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaykum Do you have to pay zakat on gold that you wear? Uh, the ulama have differed on this topic of whether to pay zakat on gold uh, that is worn. As for gold that is rented out, of course, all the ulama are, are agreed that zakat needs to be paid on that. As for gold that is worn, such as ornaments, such as rings, such as jewelry, then the, correct, the most correct opinion is that it must be paid. And this is the opinion of, uh, of the Hanafi ulama and also one opinion in the Hanbali madhab. As for the vast majority of ulama, such as the Shafi'i madhab and the uh, Maliki and the, uh, and the correct opinion in the Hanbali madhab, then they say that, that, they, that uh, zakat on gold and silver that is worn doesn't have to be paid. Uh, the correct opinion is that it has to be paid. Uh, this is based on many different authentic hadith that Rasulullah once came up to a woman and she was uh, she had a child in her in her arms and the child had a small um, uh, gold bra- bracelet and Rasulullah said, "Have you paid the zakat from that?" And she said, "No, ya Rasulullah." And Rasulullah said, Are you, "Will you be happy that on the day of judgment Allah will make it a ring of fire if, for her on the uh, you know for you on the day of judgment?" And so she she became af- <coughs> she became afraid. And so she took off the, uh, the, the bracelet and, 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 th- and gave it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam straight away. But this is an authentic hadith in Tirmidhi and others. <coughs> Imam Tirmidhi, rahimahullah, he reported this hadith and then he said, وَلَا يَصِحُ حَدِيثٌ فِي هَذَا الْبَابِ There is no authentic hadith in this, in this matter uh, at all. However, the ulama uh, uh, disagreed with him and said, No, ya, ya Imam Tirmidhi, this hadith that you have reported actually is authentic. Okay, even though Imam Tirmidhi rahimullah said it's not authentic, actually it is authentic, and there are many different uh, proofs, uh, many different shawahid, many different mutatabi'at, you know, uh, mutabi'at for this uh, for this hadith, many different follow-on narrations, and so we say therefore, really zakat from the gold that one wears must be paid. This is a, this is the best opinion. Allah uh, Taala alam. Fadl akhi. On the topic of the istiqamah, uh, you, you are talking to the Prophet. I mean, there are hundreds and thousands of Muslims. Yeah. Okay. Sure. We never come to this place. Yeah. We never hear you, you talking about this. What we are expecting is a scheme from ulama. Not only the, the, what you said. Okay. I think all the scholars, all the ulama, when you go to any anyone who can say this. But yeah. what we are missing is yeah. a scheme, yeah. okay, where it is for the whole Muslims. Now, now we have thousands of children who are staying at home, yeah. who are wonder, 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 uh, wandering around, yes. okay, enjoying their life. Yes. Okay. What is, is missing is not coming and uh, encourage because it is, I think, one person to Swansea people listen to this lecture. What is missing is that for the scholars, is to come with a scheme yes. for the Muslim community. Yes. Okay. How we keep our children? How we keep our generation? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Khan. Yes. That's what is missing. Yes. Okay. Can we pay the the money for steam practice? This is what yeah. this is what exactly missing. I yeah. mean, there are hundreds and thousands of Muslims. Okay. Yeah. During the normal year, especially in the summer. Okay? Yes. Away from the most, they are missing. Yes, correct. What is, what is, 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 is important. Right. The the brother Zakullah Khair, Zakullah Khair, uh, he mentioned that uh, uh, you know the things that we are talking about is not practical stuff, and what we really should be talking about when we talk about istiqama is practical stuff and how do we actually uh, look after this small community that we have here. Uh, you know, so many reverts here. How do we practically look after the children? So many children that we have, Muslim children, on the streets, etc., etc. How do we look after them? Uh, and the and and what the ulama should and, this, and the duat should be really doing is giving us practical steps. I respect your opinion, and this is a, a good advice, and I will try and remember this. Wallahi, my, my brother, uh, my respected brother, uh, I, I spend uh, you know many many uh, nights thinking on how to actually uh, look after my my brothers and how to give them practical steps to to live. Uh, I live in the West, uh, you know, so many th- hundred, you know so many tens of years I've been living in the West, and I have a family in the West, and I, we face this, we face the same problem. Uh, unfortunately, this issue of Aqliyat al-Islamiyah uh, is a very major issue 
every aqliyat islami every uh, muslim minority has their own problems it is very difficult for a visiting da'i or a visiting scholar to actually uh, give a uh, a step by step solution really uh, uh, someone needs to live here look at the solution look at the situation of how people are and then give them practical steps so uh, my advice really would be that in the la as as the time passes as I become more more understanding and knowledgeable about what the situation of every city, city here is, and then I will definitely tackle this. This is something which is very very important to me, very need, very very needed. Uh, uh, and and uh, if you will notice all my other talks, my always my talks are regarding the youth and how to uplift the youth. And uh, and Allah knows best. We have certain programs that we've started to actually uh, uh, do this. Uh, 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 as a as a you know. And unfortunately, I'm only here for a couple of uh, hours today, for example. So it is very difficult for me to actually give you pr- practical steps straight away. Uh, so if if your respected self could uh, ask me appropriate questions, that that uh, that might help because, mashallah, you have this himma for this uh, for this ummah to do something for this ummah over here. Can, can, then, can the money being used for for these schemes? Right. Why don't you ask me a more specific question? Like you can't just say a scheme. Uh, you know, can zakat money I mean, be used to build a mosque? Can we? We could take them to uh, make a camp for them. Right. Okay. Zakat can, money cannot I'll be tell used. You an okay. Right. That we have five weeks, six weeks. Okay. Yes. Can we make a program yes. for the Muslim children? Yes. Okay. Sponsor it. Yes. I, I, I don't know From the zakat money, money, you mean? For zakat. Yes. This is this is what we need. Right. Zakullah khair. Zakat money cannot be used except for the eight things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran. Some of the ulama have uh, understood from the verse of the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa fi sabilillah, to mean anything that is for the cause of Allah. So they have allowed zakat for, for imams in the mosques, they have allowed zakat for printing of Islamic material, they have allowed zakat for dua, they have allowed zakat for anything therefore that is in, the, that is, uh, can be termed as fi sabilillah. However, the best and most correct opinion that is, that is followed by most of the ulama, and that is strongest as regards the Arabic language, as regards the tafsir of the Quran, as regards the sunnah of Rasulullah is that the zakat cannot be used except for the eight categories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran. That is for the, the, the musafirin, that is for the, uh, the, 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 the fuqaran, the masakin, that is for the amirin, for the, for, you know, in English, let me translate, for, 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 the, for the fuqara, for those people who are faqir, who don't even have anything to eat, the masakin, those people who are on the borderline uh, of the society, uh, as regards the monetary fin- financial situations, concerned as th- those people who collect the zakat, those people who are fighting in the cause of Allah, those people who are gharimeen, those people who are in debt, those people who are prisoners, those people uh, who are muallifat uh, qulubihim, those people who are, if you give them money, uh, they will accept Islam, uh, and uh, etc. And, the, and these are the people that zakat money can be used. As for the, the youth programs, and as for uh, these uh, community support programs, then no, zakat money cannot be used for them. Zakat money cannot be used for them. Uh, and I do emphasize this point because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not left the, has not left the issue of zakat upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to explain. Rather, he has explained where the zakat money should be, should be given by himself. This is why he has mentioned it in the, in the Quran, uh, and the eight categories that I've just mentioned to you. Uh, so, really as for the, as for these youth programs, mashallah, we have other ways of raising money for that. You know, just from the Jumu'ah prayer, for example, we can raise a lot of money. From, uh, um, you know, uh, functions that, that are held, you know, we can raise a lot of money. I know of brothers, uh, who have raised money just for example being in the mosque uh, uh, raised you know, you know hundreds of thousands of pounds in one one sitting so you can you can hold uh, uh, you know fund collections etc uh, uh, for that uh, you know it's quite quite easy to actually convince the youth youth don't require that much money youth functions don't require that much money uh, but as for your question uh, for your respected self regarding zakat money then unfortunately we cannot uh, use it for that zakallah khair subhanallah allahumma bihamdik أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك